Crush Gasm, the podcast that's been dedicated to bringing you the highs and lows of crushes, but we're shaking things up for the next couple of months to crush on a whole decade. Yep, we're talking all things 90s by breaking it down year by year with some familiar faces. Well, voices, like today's guest, Bradley Putin, the host of The Pandemic and the co-host of Prevenge of the Nerds, who is here to talk about the year that had us all screaming, Hello, Wisconsin, and that's 1998. Bradley, how are you? I'm doing fantastic. I'm even wearing my flannel. Oh, see, you're in you're in the mood. I have a crop top, so I think that's pretty 90s. Right? Yeah. I mean, it's my pajamas, but still. It still counts. <laughs> yeah. So before we start and dive into the year, where can we find you and your shows online? Yes. So you can find me on all the places, YouTube, Twitch, uh, Apple at The Fandemic or Prevenge of the Nerds. Pretty much anything out there, type in The Fandemic and you'll find me. Alrighty. Well, in 1998, we're going to get started. I was starting middle school and I was marinating in teen angst and that was on the horizon. My mom was not happy about that. But what were you doing that year? <laughs> I was graduating from high school. I was a senior in high school uh, and it was fun. <laughs> I mean, when you look at those old, it's crazy to look at, like, even, like, the, I'll see videos of the class of 2002, 2003, and it looks, like, so vintage. It's crazy. Yeah, it is. <laughs> I, I, I look back at I, I look back at those pictures, and I'm just like, man, I was a handsome dude. I wish I could look like that again. <laughs> I wish I had the body of my, nine, of my 18-year-old self. I, but, isn't that crazy? I always think it was the worst at that time. Then you look back, and you're like, it wasn't that bad. Right? Yeah. I, I, I had him go in the military, uh, you know, the next year. So, mm, so that's yeah. probably why out of all the things of 1998, Saving Private Ryan was one of your top choices. It was. Uh, so um, story behind Saving Private Ryan is so, uh, I was I wasn't sure what I wanted to do with my life, whether I wanted to go to college, whether, whether I wanted to do whatever. Um, but I, I remember going to the movie and watching Saving Private Ryan when it came out in the theater. And after that, I was like, dude, I need to go in the military. Oh. And so that kind of set my life. I mean, I got to go all over the world. I mean, I've been to like 13 different countries. And I mean, I, my time in the Air Force was, was, you know, was worth it to say the least. I mean, that's what I wish I knew about the Navy because my friends that went in were stationed in Hawaii and my nephew went to Japan and I'm like, dang, I chose wrong. Stupid college. <laughs> yeah, it's like it's it, it's always one of those like the road that the road less traveled, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, man, I didn't get out when I did what, you know, would I have gone somewhere and, and been killed, you know, or, you know, or things like that. And you. It's just one of those things you look back and like, yep, yeah, I, 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 I went on the road. I got the T-shirt. I it, it doesn't fit anymore, but I still try. Cut it out and um, sew it to the back of a jean jacket. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Actually, uh, my parents brought me a few months ago. They found one of my old um, BDUs, which is battle dress uniform. One of one of my shirts from that I used to wear when I was in the service. And uh, I mean, in it, you know, I mean, it was tight, but I mean, I could get it on, but I, I offered it to all my kids and they're like, <laughs> no, <laughs> like, wow, thanks. <laughs> Rude. But do they also like Saving Private Ryan? Is this something you've shared with them since then? Are they old enough? Um, They're probably old enough, but I don't think I, I, I don't think I'm cool enough for <laughs> For that yeah i can't i can't get them into war movies i get that i mean i'm not a big war movie person as well but this movie it was like oscar winning oscar nominated in part to tom hanks and matt damon doing such a great job were, th were those sort of the two characters you kind of focused in on when you were getting inspired yeah so i mean obviously tom hanks and in, in, in that role but also the situation of like you know this team going in to find this one guy be who's from Iowa, which is where I'm from, uh, where like, you know, all five of his brothers have been killed in World War II, you know, and like the whole time I'm thinking my grand, I'm thinking of my grandpa who served in World War II, you know, it's just like, man, my grandpa's a hero. I want to be a hero too. And, you know, just like my grandpa would tell me stories and the stories changed uh, 
from before I was in the military till after I was in the military. Definitely, definitely, it was different. But yeah, I mean, like, uh, Tom Hanks was amazing in that movie. And I, I mean, I think, I think, I think those between that and Forrest Gump are probably like some of his most memorable uh, movies. I mean, mo- most of Tom Hanks, you're going to remember them. But I mean, like, as far as like, like the, the movies that are, that are going to rattle off your tongue when you say Tom Hanks, I'm, like for me anyway, it's Forrest Gump, it's Pride, Saving Private Ryan. Then I go to Big and, you know, because Big is just like one of the greatest movies that's ever been made. But, you know, that's that's a, another story. <laughs> that's when we do Christian on the 80s. <laughs> I'm in. I'm in. <laughs> that one's gonna be a little harder for me, but I think I can do it because I, I I love pop culture, so I'd love mm-hmm. to dive in. So in 1988, I'm really shocked that Tom Hanks didn't get People Sexiest Man, which we're gonna talk about now because it's a little recurring segment we have since I talk about that issue of People Magazine every year. We're gonna talk about the sexiest man and who won Most Beautiful Person for People. Uh, do you have any guesses on who they were? I'll give you a hint: both are male. <laughs> Okay, uh, let's see here. 1998. I'm going to guess. I'm going to guess. Man, I was really going to guess Tom Hanks. Um, I'm going to guess Michael Jackson. For both? <laughs> no. No. Uh, uh, for, for person of the year, I'm going to guess Michael Jackson. And then as far as sexiest man i'm gonna go george clooney good guess george clooney's i think taken it a couple times but in 1998 uh the sexiest man alive was declared to be harrison ford and the most beautiful person was leonardo dicaprio they both had huge hits the year before with air force one and titanic so it made some sense yeah that yeah that just makes sense titanic's 25th anniversary is this year so uh, yeah yeah. they, they released a really weird poster where rose has curly hair and also straight hair so it's a really it's um going viral for some weird edits <laughs> right i know the theater that i work at we're getting it and i'm i i want to do like some uh, like an ultimate uh ultimate like valentine's day thing around that movie but we'll we'll see what if that happens but harrison ford man leave it to me like I, my brain doesn't go straight to star wars this is like the first time ever <laughs> but that's awesome harrison ford <laughs> Han will always shoot first. I mean, he is, I'm mean, looking back, he was very, very, I mean, he's still a handsome guy, but you see those older pictures, like the first Star Wars, oh my God, heartthrob through and right? through. If I was in the 70s, I def, and old enough, I definitely would have tried to get with that guy. He was so gorgeous. Yeah, <laughs> and I, I mean, dude, dude's still rocking and he's in his like, what, late 80s now? I mean, he's up there. He's up there, but he's still, and he's, every time he does an interview, I swear he is on some herbal refreshments. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm, I'm thinking you're probably right there. I, like, so I remember when, and I don't know if it's true or not, but like uh, Sean Connery is only like four or five years older than Harrison Ford. Oh, wow. Seems a lot older. He could, right. Yeah. Hmm, that's weird. Yeah, because there. I mean, he was his dad in Indiana Jones, but. <laughs> But they always do that, don't they? <laughs> yeah, they do. <laughs> they're only like two years older and they're like, you're a mom now. <laughs> but since we're talking about Leo Harrison Ford and we're on movies, we're going to stick with the movies of 1998 and a couple mm-hmm. that came out that already had kind of a fandom built into them due to them being Disney and well, introducing Pixar. Um, the musical adventure of Mulan and A Bug's Life. Um, with Mulan, we were nearing the end of that sort of Disney renaissance, that era where Disney movies were very like Broadway inspired with all the music and everything. And this was the first time for me that I felt the female lead was like a sort of badass. Uh, do you think Disney was maybe nervous about this release, making her not so princessy? Yeah, and I think the marketing showed for that too, because they didn't go all in with the marketing for Mulan. Uh, but but I, I like the I, the animated version better than the live action version oh, for, for sure. sure. <laughs> uh, but and I remember because I mean I I was also I've been in martial arts my entire life. Like we were all pumped for that movie. We we're like, yes, Disney martial arts movie please but- as i say we were learning about my school district uh bless their hearts they tried but we were learning about chinese history and our teacher was like hey there's this new movie mulan let's pop it in and i was like i don't 
think that goes with the lesson, but it's cool. And we only got through half of it in class. And I was really upset. So I made my mom go buy the VHS like that weekend. I was like, I gotta know how it ends, mom. <laughs> but it yeah. did, you know, they might've been nervous, but it did pretty well. It was the number seven uh, movie that year. But as for Bugs Life, it did a bit better. It was number five. And along with Toy Story, we talked about Tom Hanks. It's probably one of his biggest movies. It set up this sort of like thing with Pixar where they're like, let's take a thing that doesn't talk and have feelings and give it a voice and feelings. <laughs> like we have cars and I mean, they even have Inside Out where they have emotions, have emotions. Do you think there's anything like you would want to see brought to that Pixar format we haven't seen yet? Mm, that's a great question. I think probably we'd have a good, yeah, I want to I want to see I mean, cuz I'm a huge Star Wars fan. I want to see a Star Wars. I want to see Pixar, Star Wars, something or other. Like that sort of animation. It doesn't have to be uh, definitely not like a Skywalker or anything like that, but I want to see something with droids in space or it doesn't even really have to be Star Wars, but I want sci-fi. I want to I want to go science fiction just so they could really really like make it out there and awesome i wonder if they would well they've done i was gonna say robots but we have wally but he didn't really have a mm. voice and that was i think a very adult movie <laughs> i don't know yeah. a lot of kids that love wally but yeah i, I think something sci-fi definitely for sure now you were talking about mulan so uh so me ming na wen who was the uh the who was the voice for Mu mulan mm -hmm. do you know what else she's been in yeah, she's in um, the book of Boba Fett. <laughs> book of Boba Fett, and she was in Agents of Shield. She was Chung Lee. Yeah, she's so like she's been. Them. Yeah, so she's been in. She so she's got ties to Marvel, Disney, Star, and Star Wars. I think the only other person to do that has maybe been Samuel Jackson. Yeah, because he was Frozone. <laughs> yeah, because he is Frozone, Mace Windu, and uh, Nick Fury. So yeah. Way There's a go. few others. I had to do an article about who had like, you know, we do have, we have the EGOT. We were trying to think of what to call, like, if you've been in Marvel, Disney, and Star Wars, we couldn't think of a cool, like, acronym, but EGOT, yeah, we were trying to do that. But yeah, like uh, she has it, and Samuel Jackson, those are the two that come to mind. Yeah, and Samuel Jackson just amazing. I mean, what hasn't he been in? <laughs> Uh, not well. I mean, hey, especially when you're talking about credit cards. <laughs> capital <laughs> one. Capital. Is he the Capital One guy? Yeah, he's a Capital One guy. <laughs> uh, I swear they're they're doing the most damage to the environment because I get the most junk mail from them. Oh, I know. Like, I know. I don't uh, want it. I, I, I wish that like you could just sign them like hey I don't I don't want a credit card right now but uh. yeah like where do I read Samuel Jackson or Jennifer Gardner to tell them to stop <laughs> can you imagine the deal that they got for doing the credit card commercials though and like I, you probably they probably have credit cards no not that they need it anyway yeah. they, you know they're they, you know they, they have millions of dollars but like hey here's free everything you know man mm -hmm. to be a celebrity but yeah right. We're talking about Disney and another Disney movie that went on to be sort of this like cult classic over the years is Halloween Town. It was a Disney Channel original movie, but it sort of became as popular around that time of year as Hocus Pocus. Was that something like you watched at the time or maybe watched since with your kids? So I never watched it when it came out, but my oldest daughter, who is 20 now, when she was, I came into her life when she was seven. I adopted her when she was nine, nine or ten, yeah, nine. Uh, and uh, she would watch Halloween, t Halloween Town, and Halloween Town Two all of the time, <laughs> like from September to like on November. She would watch that thing all. Yes, I have seen that those movies many of times. Do you get its like appeal? Yes and no. I, so I think, like, for me, I would just zone out. So, like, when she would put those in, it was nap time for me. So I never, like, I, I never paid a lot of attention to it. But I, but she was crazy for it. She loves that movie. So it definitely has something in there. And I, and I like th those kind of movies to kind of bring in, you know, that scary but not really scary stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, I call them, like, gateway movies. Yeah, Megan is a really good. The new movie Megan is a really good example of that too. For a recent, uh, I mean, my ten-year-old saw it and she was just she loved it, uh, and I feel, I feel that was a really good gateway horror movie. Yeah, 
well, we're going to stick with uh, not horror, but we're going to stick with like the Disney realm and fairy tales because mm-hmm. in 1998, we got a new Cinderella thanks to Drew Barrymore in Ever After. And uh, this is no shade to any of the other movies, but this one is my favorite version of it because it kind of took the classic and it felt a little fresher. It wasn't as glitzy. Do you think that's the problem with all these live action Disney movies? They don't flip the script enough? I think I think yes and no. I, I think that they can't find that happy medium of turning something new. They either go all the way too far or they or or not enough. So it's either like and you when you're doing a remake, especially on, on these beloved things like you know, Little Mermaid and, and all that stuff, you know, there there's you have to like I want to keep everybody happy that loves the movie, but we, you know, we're wanting to say something. So we have to, you know, what do we have to do to, to say what we want to say? So, I mean, I give them, I, I give people credit for trying a lot of this stuff. Um, but I, I think a lot of times they just go, they actually go too far. Yeah. I think it's like, like you said, like it's a beloved thing and it, it's going to be really hard to top a classic. It's mm-hmm. like trying to do, I don't know, like The Wizard of Oz or something like that. I mean, they did it with like, uh, that, you know, the Broadway play and mm-hmm. everything. But Wicked. Yeah, but with like Disney, and especially in the Disney Renaissance, those movies are kind of like, don't touch. That's why I like the Jungle Book one, because it's like, that one's so old and it's not as shiny and brand new with the songs and everything. I think that one did fine. But mm-hmm. once they started touching like Little Mermaid, Beauty and the Beast, I was like, a little hesitant i'm gonna give little mermaid a chance because that girl can sing so i'm i'm kind of excited i'm not gonna be like eh, yet <laughs> yeah and, and i think that they get in this thing like i mean i don't if you, if you tell a good story and you're and you're true to the story that you're telling i don't care just I, you're gonna get my money no matter what you know just uh i, I feel like everything now you know, they just I, I don't think people that are that a lot of these people that are that are in charge of these movies really love what they're doing. Like I, I'm thinking, and I'm trying I'm saying this all wrong, but I'm thinking like you're going to get this director and the producers, and they're in love with this, and they have an amazing story, and then they tell their story, and it goes up to the next person, the the guy in the suit, and they're like, no, we need to put X, Y, and Z in here, and that's where things go wrong. I, I think that's what's wrong with the DC universe as well. I, I don't think that there's not a lot of love there, you know. Like, uh, you know, but like, I, I feel like you, cause you could see the, the, the nuggets of like, Hey, this is what the story that I was trying to tell. And I, you know, then you're like, damn, well, what happened? You started so good. And then it just went off. <laughs> yeah. It's like, burr, burr, burr. right. <laughs> oh, man. But on the opposite side of the spectrum of Disney, we had a lot of raunchy comedies that air like Can't Hardly Wait and There's Something About Mary, which did incredibly well in theaters that year. And I feel like movies that like that, they either sink or swim, well back then. But Mary just kind of swam like an Olympian. And thinking back, did you think at the time that movie was going to be as big and as everlasting as it became? Uh, there's something about Mary. Mm-hmm. I, You know, I... To me, it was just another comment. I actually like Can't Hardly Wait more than I liked uh, Something About Mary. Um, but no, I did not. I like, I, and I probably haven't seen uh, that movie since the 90s, to be honest. I, I mean, it's it's good. It's fine. It's And if it's on, if I'm going through the channels and it's on, I'd probably watch it for a little while. But um, yeah, there's something about Mary. I, I get, there, you know, the, it has a couple of funny parts, uh, like the hair gel and thing, you know, like that. But the rest of it, I was like, eh, it's fine. I agree with you. Can't hardly wait is superior to me, and I think probably for you, you were graduating that year, so this movie kind of fit perfectly into your mm. life. I mean, and it was Jennifer Love Hewitt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and like, I mean, everybody loved Jennifer Love Hewitt. I mean, when she walks in, it's slow motion. Ethan Embry is just adorable. I, I freaking with Seth Green is probably the standout of the cast, though, as Kenny, the Absolutely. wannabe rapper. Yeah, <laughs> was was Idle Hands at that year as well? Idle Hands? I'm not sure. But if it was, he was having a lot of success that year. Yeah. <laughs> um, For me, though, I got to go see the cast did like a... Kind of like a 
talk or something about the movie and it was a really good night i have the vhs and my goal was to get like everyone in that movie to sign it because there's just so many stars and i've, I've only gotten like three or four. Oh, that's that's awesome though and the fact that it's on a vhs man yeah, I tried to get Jennifer Love Hugh and she did a book signing at uh, when I was in college, but I didn't have any money to like get the book. So I was like, darn. Mm. One day, one day, if I ever move back to California, it's still on my list. <laughs> yeah. She's really good in 911. She is. I like her in that show. <laughs> oh, she's I mean, I watched that up until it got a little crazy with the flood. And then I, I know. <laughs> I fell off. I know it, it, it's that's it was so bad like <laughs> okay like, how I mean I get you, you gotta cause drama and th- but these like how many natural disasters can this California have I mean like <laughs> just LA too just LA <laughs> right right <laughs> <laughs> another like rom-com or you know kind of comedy that year that was a cute love story was the wedding singer and i feel like this was the start of adam sandler's kind of like rom-com phase mm. but i also think i don't think adam sandler would be a rom-com lead unless he was the one like backing it with happy madison do you agree <laughs> absolutely and <laughs> well that and, and with drew barrymore because those two together are magic i mean the, those two i, I they could you don't even need a plot for a movie, but put those two in there and make it and have it set in the in the eighties, and you're gonna win. <laughs> uh, my husband recently went on a five minute rant about how The Wedding Singer is the best eighties period piece <laughs> ever. He's not wrong. Uh, <laughs> yes. He's one hundred percent correct. <laughs> so, all those movies, as wonderful as they are, couldn't compare to the number one movie from that year, which I've never actually seen because space legit scares me and that is armageddon but what i did love about that movie the freaking song from aerosmith um i was like really shocked it wasn't in the top 10 for that year but yeah because there was like a lot of romantic songs there was shania twain's you're still the one truly madly deeply from savage garden casey and jojo's all my life and a couple of others do you remember this year being as romantic as the charts made it appear you know, I do, but it, but it, it could have just been my hormones as an 18-year-old <laughs> male. But, you know, I don't want to miss a thing. Uh, I mean, we all sang it and we all danced to it and in and, and, and at prom and all those. <laughs> I mean, I have very, very fond memories of that song. It's so good. And it doesn't it have to be from this year, but do you have like a favorite love song? I do. Um, it, the my wife and I song, which is uh, "You" by Collective Soul. Oh, yes. You kept it nineties. <laughs> yeah, I did keep it nineties. Well, it, was, it came a little bit after, but oh. but uh, Collective Soul is definitely like I, I gravitate towards like nineties music. Mm-hmm. And uh, what are they doing now? I mean, Ugly Kid Joe just released a new album, and it's actually pretty decent. <laughs> You're keeping those '90s bands a fed. <laughs> I am. I am. Uh, there's a singer. Uh, I don't know if you remember the band Crossfade from the late '90s. Mm-mm. They had a couple of pretty good, like they. It might have been earlier to uh, double lots, but um, they had a couple of bigger rock anthem songs. But the the singer Mark Wilkelson, he went on to do uh, more like singer songwriter stuff. And is fantastic. <laughs> like, like, yeah. <laughs> so, but you know, all those bands, all these like romantic songs. But I found funny is that the number one song that year was more on the other side of love, the sexual side. It was next to close. And for those who don't remember, the chorus starts, "Baby, when we're grinding." That's right. I get so excited. So on top of people being in love, people were really. You know they're going co about the the other side as a parent are there any songs today that you hear and you're like hmm what's going on there yes uh very much so a uh, little bit less with my 20 year old because i mean she's a grown woman and she's <laughs> in seattle and you know she gets to do, do live her life but like a couple years ago when she was still at home she would be playing things and i'd be like um uh i don't know how i feel about this right now <laughs> I mean, if the when when she would take over the radio, Kendall, I love you. She would say, "Okay, is it okay if I play the non-clean version?" I'm like, "Oh boy." <laughs> uh, but 
she's she li- all she listens to is show tunes now and it's fantastic yeah i mean back in the day they were letting us play that i remember it would play at middle school dances and i was like but at the time i didn't really i guess i didn't really listen that deeply to it mm-hmm. but as i got older and i was like oh remember that song i was like this is wild this song is a lot there's a lot of songs from back then like i'll listen to now and i'm like oh um <laughs> i i that that's kind of not good <laughs> they're like wow our parents well we ha- i talked about this in 1994 our parents just were not paying attention to what we were doing for mo- the most part <laughs> so would you say parents just don't understand i don't think they wanted to they were busy <laughs> <I> think- <laughs> so like armageddon i only really knew the song that goes with the Dawson's Creek the theme song by Paula Cole because for me wasn't a show I was into I was like I don't get this it was a little too emotional for me but was that something you tuned into you were a teenager maybe it was I did not I I I, like you I I think I watched like one episode and I found it really stupid yeah I was going through the channels one day and I stopped on it and I believe it was Michelle Williams was like in a church or something crying and I was like this is just ridiculous. Yeah, I, I, and I don't mind like the soapy stuff, but I, I could never get into Dawson's Creek. Uh, you know, well, I guess Smallville came out in '99, I believe. Mm, yeah, it was a little yeah. later. But what well, I will say, Dawson's Creek, I did a series where I just watched series finales, and Dawson's Creek has a really good series finale. I was enthralled. Didn't really? know, yeah, I didn't know anything about what happened previously, but I was really enthralled by their finale. So, you know, they, they did good at the end. For me, I don't know how their fans feel, but for me, it was good. I mean, they're always good. Everybody's going to always want more. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's how it is when you get attached to a show. Yeah. At least two seasons, you they're your friends. They're your weekly oh, yeah. friends. But a show that I did watch back then was that 70s show, which... It's incredibly hard, I feel, to make a show that's kind of centered around an era and have it work so well. There's a lot that try and fail. They did it perfectly. But are you hopeful for that 90s show? Yes, it comes out tomorrow. Uh, And (laughs) I am so excited as well. Uh, I will say, um, I did just watch the new Night Court. How'd you like it? It was absolutely stupid. (laughs) Not a fan. No, it was so bad. And it was bad. I, I don't even know if I can give it another episode. Because they released three, I think. And I just watched the first one. And obvi- it was obvious laugh tracks. And the jokes weren't even funny. Except for like maybe two parts. And you're like, you're laughing at this? Okay. <laughs> My friend Dre, he runs, he hosts Masturbators. And he does these brackets for like um, public polls. And he did uh, TV sitcoms. And Night Court whooped Frasier's behind. And I was so upset. I was like, I swear NBC Peacock is paying people to vote for this for promotion. How is it beating Frasier? <laughs> yeah. Um, I, Frasier is definitely better than Night Court. Frasier is like one of the best shows that came out of the 90s. So amazing. Mm-hmm. But for that 90s show, what are some 90s things that you hope they like put into the plot or that we might just see in the background or just like, you know, things they're, they're going to incorporate? Definitely. We're going to get some grunge in there. I think so. Though, I think there'll be a lot of Nirvana references, Nirvana, Pearl Jam, Soundgarden, uh, which my very first concert was actually Soundgarden and Skid Row. Wow. Uh, yes. Yes. I, I, I actually touched uh, the Soundgarden's bus, and I was 13 years old. I went with my mom and my sister, and Chris Cornell gave me a high five. I had no idea who he is at that time, and, <laughs> and I, I accidentally washed my hands afterwards. But yes, I got a high five from Chris Cornell. Where you go? Was your mom the fan? Your sister? <laughs> my sister is my sister, and my mom really. But, oh wow. yeah. But yeah, we went for Skid Row, and and we I didn't I never we never heard of Soundgarden, and they rocked it so bad it was so amazing. So you were a fan after that? Oh yes. I mean that happens sometimes. The opener sometimes you're like hmm, I'm gonna walk away a fan. Well, that's a good thing. Oh but, yeah. But it's horrible when the opener makes you want to just like lay down and take a nap. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> that's uh, the opposite. I'm like oh I'm too old for them to be standing during this. <laughs> yeah. I want a seat. <laughs> so. What I hope we do see in that 90s show, even though I did not watch this show, I just think it's so funny that 
Dr. Quinn Medicine Woman was a series. I think that's a weird concept and it was a hit show. Did you watch that one? I did not. <laughs> um, I was, so I think the show that I probably watched the most out of the 90s was, was probably The Next Generation. Star Trek. Uh, yep, Star Trek The Next Generation. Uh, and I, mean, I, I think that was probably like my favorite, but yeah, Dr. Quinn. Uh -uh. What a weird I, concept, like an old timey doctor, like in the what she's like in the West or pioneer yeah. times. Like, I'm just like that and murder. She wrote, I like these are wild shows, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And I'm actually surprised that murder. She wrote has not been remade. Uh, they're actually working on a murder. She wrote like show with Retta, I believe from parks and rec. Interesting. <laughs> I know. I was like, Hmm, it was already weird in the 90s. Why are we break? She obviously was murdering people. Right? <laughs> and what and what a twist with that is that though too. I mean like I, mean, uh, I, I wouldn't put it poster. <laughs> but and I think a show that we are definitely going to see referenced if they get to this I don't know what era they're kind of probably more grunge so maybe not uh, so that's early 90s but i think they're gonna definitely pull some seinfeld because that was oh, like yeah. the biggest show and it actually ended in 1998 did you tune into the finale because i remember the night it went all and it was a huge deal i did uh i remember i, I remember the finale yes i also remember almost missing it because i was high <laughs> <laughs> yes uh, um i love seinfeld you jerry seinfeld was a genius for making a show about nothing and it just becoming everything well like i said uh, my friend dre masturbators he did uh that bracket with the sitcoms and seinfeld took it all they were the, the number one out of all the votes but what do you think makes that show so representative of that decade i think it's just the group of people that that it was i mean because uh um, seinfeld and and oh my gosh well i can't think of his name uh george he, kramer G uh, yep george kramer and mm. yeah and eileen eileen i think I, they all were just so good i mean like like friends was different this is like seinfeld was like the anti-friends mm -hmm. i was like you could see the things happening in Seinfeld. You could actually like, hey, I, yeah, I can relate to this with my friend Bobby Joe, Neil Hare, you know, whatever. But with with, with friends, it was just kind of like, eh, that's okay. <laughs> Are you not a friends fanatic. Uh, it's okay. Um, my wife loves Friends, but like, I, I mean, if I had a choice, Seinfeld or Friends, I I would watch Seinfeld all the time. <laughs> I think there's people I feel like friends are like yeah it's either you are like a, like you have to be like 110% or you're like it's fine or there's like that third person who absolutely hates it with the passion <laughs> which for that's kind of a lot of things but friends seems to be one of the biggest things for that yeah I mean I, and I for what it was when it came out it, it you know br bravo I mean you're like these people are making a million dollars an episode you know hey more the power to you you, you came up with something, you executed it, great job. I mean, you found a way to keep it going forward. You know, you try to spin off with Joey because Joey was the best part of the show. Uh, you know, uh, they tried really hard to get, was it Lazy Cat to be popular? I Smelly mean, Cat. <laughs> Smelly Cat, yeah, yeah, that's what it is. I mean, I, and it had its stuff, but man, like, uh, Seinfeld, Seinfeld is way superior to Fred. <laughs> Well, um, for me, Phoebe was the was the best part of this show. But now we're gonna do a little one another segment. We're gonna do popcorn questions. So I have yes. questions. I have fifty. So just give me a number one through fifty. We'll do five, and we'll see how it goes. <laughs> All right. Well, my, let's start with number eight. That's my favorite number. Do you owe money to Columbia House for any CDs? Oh yeah. <laughs> You're like shh. They're watching. What if that's <laughs> Capital One? What if that's what Capital One became? <laughs> oh, you know what? You were on to something there. That I mean. And they're trying to get, they're going to, if you send that back, they're going to see your name and all your information. And they'll be like, oh, and by the way, you owe us $300 for collective soul CDs. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. And John, and, and the Young Guns 2 soundtrack. <laughs> 
I always would like be like, Mom, I want these ones. And she'd be like, oh, okay, sure. And she'd never get them for me. Right. I remember like the, the it, it would come in like the newspaper and it would have a place where you could tape a penny to it to uh-huh. send it back. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so your next number. Uh, let's do uh, let's do 43. My age. Okay, so you go to the Scholastic Book Fair with $20 in your pocket. Your mom and dad are feeling great that day. What are you buying? I am buying not books. I'm buying toys. <laughs> oh, you're the you're the Ferrari poster bookmark yep. eraser kid. <laughs> yep, yep. Or or graphic novels. I'll take that. I would, I would do graphic novels if they had them. Um, some because some sometimes they would, sometimes they wouldn't. Some, so sometimes you get lucky. There might be like a Spider Man or, or an X Men something or other. Possibly X Men because of the animated series. So you strike me as a kid who would buy the how to draw comics and animal books. <laughs> mm, yep, and and I that's what I found out that I couldn't draw. <laughs> <laughs> me too. <laughs> My brother got that skill. Yep, mine too. <laughs> <laughs> he could literally just look at something, draw <laughs> me. I'm like, still, I still draw probably the same as maybe when I was 16. <laughs> me too. Where the skills stopped. <laughs> Next number. Well, let's do, uh, let's do 21. So there was Darkwing Duck. There was the Mighty Ducks. There was Duck Tales. So, in your opinion, why were ducks so cool in the 90s? Why were ducks so cool in the 90s? <laughs> what were? I mean, what study could they have done to be like kids love ducks? <laughs> That's a great question. I, 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 I would have to say that um, because of the color scheme, white, the bright orange beak, and the only ducks we knew was Donald, and he talked funny, really. <laughs> uh, and then you built on his family because he was he was related to, uh, uh, to to was because was, was it Uncle Scrooge his uncle? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Huey, Dewey, and Louie, and right, there right. Was- I think a female duck that might have been involved. It's been Daisy? a while. <laughs> yeah, there was Daisy and there was like another. Yeah. There's a lot of ducks in the 90s. That That's <laughs> oddly weird. I'm actually going to do research on that. <laughs> I, you know, this is also Capital One. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Next number. Let's do, uh, I was 18 in 1998, so let's do 18. All right. So it's Friday night and you're going to make it a blockbuster night. What are you renting? What are I three am... movies that you're like gonna throw some cash at? All right, I'm gonna rent Batman '89. I am going to rent Big Trouble in Little China, and I am going to uh, test the waters if get something. Uh, was well, it am, am I 18 or am I not 18 at this time? Well, you could be 18. Okay, I'm 18. Okay, so then I'm definitely gonna want something like probably Jean Claude Van Damme. So you get that one or two good scenes with boobs in there <laughs> um so like probably like blood sport kickboxer double team you know definitely a van damme movie my mom was in love with rob van with him called mm. john claude van damme not rvd the wrestler but she would watch I mean. like universal soldier all the freaking time she's like he's so hot <laughs> You know, she's not wrong. Yeah. I mean, that, muscles from Brussels. <laughs> I was like, I don't think this is appropriate for my age, but let's keep watching it, Mom. Bring it. <laughs> Again, they just didn't want to understand back then. Yeah. <laughs> Your last number? Uh, let's do... Uh, let's do 50. All right. So back in the day, Nickelodeon made this time capsule. Uh, in the 90s, what would you have put in that represented the 90s? I would have put my flannel, my red and white checkered flannel shirt. <laughs> it had a hood on it. I think it's still in my bedroom closet at, at my parents' house. Uh, you know what? No, let's take that back. I, I would do, I would put a VHS tape. Do you have like one in mind? Like the best e. 90s? E.T. Oh, no, not oh. E.T. Uh, I don't, dude, that didn't come in the 90s. Let's see here. Probably. Probably, I'm gonna do say my probably it's my Saving Private Ryan double VHS tape. Ooh, gotta love the double VHS. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Wait, hold on, the movie's not over. We just have to put in the other tape. Right? Uh, <laughs> uh, you know what? The one that was the worst with the double D VHS. Hmm. Fellowship of the Ring. <laughs> oh God, it's crazy to think that came out when VHSs were still going. Do you know what the last movie that was released on VHS is? 
I'm gonna go maybe Shrek. No, it was like it was Spirit. It was like a, oh. some. It was like a horse, a horse movie. movie. <laughs> yeah. The horse girls everywhere could have one last VHS. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> so, our last thing is, if you were the age you are now, but in 1998, what do you think your life would be like? I think it'd be pretty cool because I'm gonna make the best of what I got with whatever I got. So, um, I think that be different. I probably, I, I'd probably been more of a military guy. I don't take a lot, a lot of things too serious. So, I think I probably would have. I think it'd be, I think it'd be pretty good. Good life. Yeah, yeah, it was a good time. We're you know we're pre uh, pre two thousand one, and uh, we're it was still fun. War. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we had like Saving Private Ryan, but we also had Can't Hardly Wait, so things were still kind of balanced. <laughs> I probably would have moved to L.A. to try to become an actor. Hmm. That's what I was gonna do. That was my plan when I went in the military. It's like I'm gonna do my my time military. I'm gonna I'm gonna go be an actor. <laughs> but I mean, you could have in the next year, '99, if you'd done that. What would you have been in? You could have been in The Sopranos. <laughs> right, and that would have been awesome. I, I all I wanted to be is a guy that gets killed on on the moon or in the show. <laughs> or you could have been a voice on Futurama or Family Guy that started. In I would love to be a voice. I do a voiceovers. <laughs> well, I think it'd be awesome. I know. I always wanted to do that as well. As my dream is like, be a Disney character because you're gonna get paid for life. <laughs> right. Mhm. Mhm. That's my goal. But before we say adios to 1998, can you remind people where they can find you and the pandemic and Prevent of the Nerds online? Yes, you can find us anywhere you get podcasts: Apple, uh, Spotify, Twitch, YouTube. You can also check out my books. Yes, plural. I have written two kids' books. One is Lovely Not My Awesome. And the second one is, is Stuffed Animal Night Force versus The Dream Invaders. And you can find those on Amazon. Ooh. The stuffed animal one sounds crazy. It's awesome. It's all about uh, stuffed animals that come alive to ward off bad dreams. Ooh, I like that. I would have loved that as a kid. However, I will say, when I was putting this whole thing together... Making a title of a book starting out with stuffed animals doesn't help me in the search category. <laughs> well, I might pop up like in books. <laughs> in right. Yep. Um, but Bradley, thank you again for coming back and talking about everything 1998 with me and everyone. You can find all that information below. And until next time, as always, keep crushing it. <laughs>